And I'm happy to welcome Mark Abrams to the Schuylkill Center, who will be our lecturer tonight. Mark is a professor of forest ecology and physiology, as well as a Steimer professor of agricultural sciences at Penn State, which no surprise is the alma mater of a big chunk of the center staff. Like me, he's a New Yorker by birth, him Poughkeepsie, me Queens. And he also, like me, went to graduate school in Michigan. He went to the one in Lansing, and I went to that one a little further south in Ann Arbor, and I hope he forgives me that choice. Uh, more importantly, he's lectured and written about old growth forests, fire ecology, climate change and forests, oak ecology, and much more. And I'm thrilled he's presenting tonight's lecture, The Rise and Fall of Our Forests, From the Lenape to Smokey the Bear. Well, as I mentioned, lecture is recorded um, and will be made available on the Schuylkill Center's YouTube channel. Welcome, Dr. Abrams. We've got to unmute you first. Sorry. Okay. There you are. Good. I got muted again. Okay. I'll share the screen and uh, enlarge this here. And while he's getting ready, uh, feel free to put your questions in chat anytime. Uh, and when we get towards the end, um, I'll start asking questions. So thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, well, just to expand on what I'm going to be talking about is. Um, uh, the role of Native Americans, what happened with Smokey the Bear during the 1930s, um, how this all affected the rise and fall of Eastern Oak Forest, which I've been studying for almost uh, 40 years now uh, throughout the Eastern US, but I'm going to concentrate this talk on the Northern Mid-Atlantic region where I do um, a lot of my, my research. And one thing that I've been interested in interested in almost from the beginning um, is really forest change or this uh, subject of forest dynamic and basically how forests change over relatively long periods of time. And, and this can be um, you know, decades or maybe a century or more if you study paleoecology. Um, I don't directly, but I look, a lot, look at a lot of that information. Then you start talking about thousands of years but I think it's very important when we're talking about forest change and particularly climate change, that we do this over a very long period. So we don't get fooled or um, particularly biased by what's happening just over a couple decades. And that's a point that I'd like to uh, tell my students a lot. Um, forests develop from young to old in forest succession. So they are changing all the time from early mid to late successional. That's fine if nothing happens, but the reality is that disturbances happen all of the time, uh, natural disturbances, and of course, uh, human caused disturbances are becoming more and more important. Uh, there are some native forest health issues, but we're mainly dealing with a lot of exotic insect and diseases now. And of course, the topic that's on everybody's mind is climate change and what that is doing to our forest. And it used to be in the past that this was fairly balanced. Uh, there's always been this debate, climate disturbance debate in ecology, but it was relatively balanced. But I think it is getting a little bit unbalanced now that everyone is kind of jumping on the climate bandwagon. And not to say that that isn't important, but we have to keep in mind that all of these other disturbance factors are ubiquitous, they are still happening. Uh, so we can't just look through the climate lens and try to explain everything uh, that way. And I think we've gone a little bit overboard and I'll talk about why um, actually climate um, hasn't been as profound in the Eastern US as other places in the country and the world. And I'll get to that uh, later. Now, as I said, climate is important, but um, it doesn't mean that the, all of these other factors like succession, disturbance, fire, lack of fire um, should be dismissed and we should just be thinking about climate. I think that's a very a big mistake. Because one thing that I documented in my career is really the importance of Native Americans. I, haven't, I certainly was not the first one to do that. I mean, uh, people going back to Gleason uh, over a hundred years ago recognized this, but we, we now know that Native Americans inhabited almost all of the hospitable areas in the United States. And one of the dominant things that they did, 
they did was burn um, extensively. And I'll talk about all of the reasons why there was Native American burning. And of course, there was also Native American agriculture. I recently got into a, a debate about a, a recent paper from New England that really played down the importance of um, burning in new, even Southern New England um, and also agriculture, which I could not believe. So I got into a little debate about that, but I'm firmly in the camp that Native American burning was a ubiquitous factor probably over the last 5,000 years and was probably more important than climate change or this lack of burning after European settlement was very, very important. So my research throughout the Eastern US is focused on major forest changes and basically the rise and fall of tree species. I've been very worried about the sustainability of our native um, uh, you know, oak and hickory and pine. Of course, we lost so much of our chestnut. Maybe chestnut with the hybrid is coming back now. Uh, so not only these changes in forest compositions, composition, but what are these drivers? I think it's very important that we understand what that is. So the themes of my talk will be Native Americans as ecological managers, and I am in the camp that these were uh, very in intelligent people. They were very good ecological managers. They were very good at agriculture. They knew how to use fire to sustain uh, prairie and uh, oak and hickory and other uh, mass species, uh, pine species as well. We will be talking about that. But how this fire cycle that was used by the Native Americans was broken after European settlement, because a lot of them came from Northern Europe and did not have a mentality of burning and they thought fire was bad. And then the extensive land use and land clearing that occurred after European settlement and what impacts this had on, on forest composition. So I'll talk about these uh, important drivers, but then I'll talk about some of the more uh, recent drivers. I will talk about climate change, fire suppression, what's going on with deer. There's so many challenges uh, to the Eastern forest. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can better manage uh, Eastern forest to sustain the dominant uh, native species, because I think that, you know, maybe over the next hundred years, um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that, you know, uh, oak, hickory, and pine are certainly threatened in the eastern U.S. These are historical dominance that we may be losing out to the, let's say, the red maple invasion, just as an example. So my research over the last 40 years really can be described by this human climate vegetation dynamic. I, I've always been interested in human impacts started with Native Americans and then what happened after European settlement, uh, what impact they had on vegetation. So humans very much affect um, uh, vegetation, but of course vegetation affects humans in terms of the food fiber and shelter that it produces. I've been very interested in climate for the last 20 or 30 years and how humans are, are altering climate, but also how does this climate change affect vegetation? It is, is it the dominant factor that has altered vegetation over the last hundred years or more? Or is land use still a very um, dominant um, factor uh, driving vegetation? So uh, climate vegetation in terms of productivity, the carbon sequestration uh, cycle and so forth. Um, so vegetation is very important for sequestering carbon and slowing down that rise in carbon and slowing down warming. Uh, humans, of course, being responsible for greenhouse gases, but there's also natural uh, variation in climate that is still continuing and will continue. And also keep in mind that we started the present warming phase being in the uh, little ice age that ended around 1850. Um, so that should not necessarily be the benchmark by which we measure this about one degree uh, increase on average. I know some places are more than that, but keep in mind that we started this warming at a very 
cold point um, during the Holocene. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. So if we look at the major forest types in the Eastern US, of course, we uh, the cold north with subboreal giving way to northern hardwood and conifer. Um, we don't think about these areas being necessarily that pyrogenic, but we also have to keep in mind that there are a lot of dry glacial outwash soils in this northern tier um, that uh, did support pine and oak and did have uh, Native American populations up there. So there was uh, some burning going on, but most of us will agree that as you go from north, particularly down south, the most pyrogenic part of the eastern U.S. is really the uh, southern coastal plain uh, and Florida. Now, they also had high Native American populations, but also had the type of vegetation and climate that supported a lot of fire. And because of this uh, temperature fire variation, uh, we go from subboreal northern hardwood without that much fire, but very quickly get into a fire type with the oak, oak hickory, uh, giving uh, way in this band here to the oak and pine and then pine. And most of us agree that this whole big part of the Eastern US is we consider a pyrogenic type, but also uh, Northern Oak and Northern Pine. So we can't exclude the Northern tier from this pyrogenic, but it's more patchy up here where it's more ubiquitous. And I think there's very little argument that this whole area um, was pyrogenic, but probably changing in the absence of fire. And I, I will be talking about that. So I'd like to just uh, talk about how I, I got my start, that I actually got my PhD, as Mike said, uh, at Michigan State about here. And of course, uh, well, I finished about 1982 and just my luck, there was a recession going on and a glut of ecologists and academia. So I had trouble finding a job. And the one job that I uh, did land was a postdoc in Kansa Prairie in the middle of Kansas. So I got my PhD in forestry and ended up working on a prairie. Um, but that was fine. I mean, I did my PhD research in fire and jack pine and they hired me because I had this background in fire. And of course, uh, they were managing this prairie with a lot of burning uh, almost annually. But as I found out that there were these thin bands of forest that we call gallery forest that were dominated by oak. And so when I wasn't doing my work in the prairie grasslands, I was actually studying the relationship of these oak forests and what was going on with them. And that really was a very important and fortuitous thing. So what I thought was not a great start to my career turned out to be one of the most important things that happened in my career, um, studying the relationship of fire and oak. And so you can see how long ago that I was uh, doing uh, this work back in the early 80s, so uh, nearly 40 years ago. Um, so th this is the uh, interior of some of these gallery forests. This is a nice sized burr oak. But what I noticed in this study is that the oaks were dominating in the overstory, but were not regenerating, very much like we see throughout the East. There was more shade tolerant elm and hackberry and redbud, but it seemed to me that the oaks did not have the ability to regenerate very well underneath their own canopy. And I found that very curious because I knew that these oaks, you know, from the paleoecology literature, existed for thousands of years. So how did they exist for thousands of years? And all of a sudden they're not regenerating. It didn't make any sense. So I started reading a lot of the Native American literature and how they managed prairie. And one thing I figured out um, in the early eighties and sort of a hypothesis, and I'm sorry, this thing is blocking my view, but I basically came up with the fire and oak hypothesis. And what I figured out um, about 40 years ago, 
is that Native Americans were burning very frequently in the understory of oak forest to keep them open so they would regenerate because, and I'll talk about this later, the mass production from oak was very important to the Native American diet. It's interesting that we really don't eat acorns now, but the Native Americans, it was one of the most important food sources for their diet. Yes, it took a lot of work because of the tannins and multiple washings and so forth, but they, um, they basically made a, a, a kind of a flour out of these and made a breads and cakes out of, out of these acorns. And so they managed, and I reason that they probably figured out, well, if we don't burn these oak forests, they're gonna change and we're gonna lose our acorns. But if we do burn them, they remain open, the oaks regenerate. So I came up with the fire in oak hypothesis at that time, which um, in a very large extent kind of defined my career. I'd like to think that I did things other than uh, fire uh, and oak, um, but that's the thing that I seem to be most famous for. And one thing I started doing about 40 years ago was a great resource. I discovered witness tree records. And basically, depending on where you are in the country, if you're in the original 13 colonies, you have the early survey trees from meets and bounds going back into the 1700s. But outside of the the original 13 colonies, the rest of the country was surveyed by the General Land Office Survey. And these records are available that so we can get a fairly good idea of what the forest looked like during the 17 and 1800s uh, from these witness trees, whether they are meat and bounds trees or they are the General Land Office Survey. And one great thing that the Forest Service is doing now is the FIA, Forest Inventory Analysis. So all over the country, they have these permanent plots and we can get uh, modern day data. Now, back 40 years ago, we had to run out and <clears throat> collect our own data on present day composition and we still do. But now to a very large extent, the Forest Service is doing that a lot of these <clears throat> witness tree data are online now, making it very easy for us uh, to download current data versus the early data, 1800s, 1700s, and basically get an idea about how forests have changed. And during my career, we've done a lot of work. I've done some of this, but I have to compliment Richard Guyette and his group um, uh, out in, out in Missouri, at Missouri State, I'm sorry, University of Missouri, um, where they basically, they have uh, put together all of the fire scar data. And we now have a very good idea of what the fire cycle was like throughout the Eastern US at about the time of European settlement. So they've done this, uh, they find very old trees, very old fire scars, and put together the fire cycle um, before European settlement, and then what after after you know after European settlement, and what happened after the Smoky the Bear. Well, what's remarkable is we all know that the Eastern U.S. is relatively mesic, and we probably all know that the Western U.S. is hotter and drier and very pyrogenic. But what was a big surprise to a lot of people is that the Mesic East burned um, quite dramatically. Um, some places every two or three years, some places five to eight years. And even up north where there's a lot less burning, uh, the lake states burned a lot. And even places in upstate uh, New York, um, Hudson Valley, Southern New England uh, had a very significant uh, fire cycle. So that's uh, very important to know. So then the next question is, where did all this fire come from? And you would think, well, you know, lightning happens all the time and uh, it's probably lightning fires, but actually that is not true. Um, the only place in the Eastern US that really has a significant fire history from lightning is the south um, and southeast 
Florida because they have a unique type of lightning there called dry lightning. The rest of the country, yes, we have lightning, but almost all of our lightning is associated with rainstorms. So that's not a very good ignition source. So we really, for most of the Eastern US, we really can't look to lightning as a very important ignition source, unless you happen to be in the coastal plain in Florida. And yes, they do have a significant amount of lightning fires. I'm not saying it never happens, but um, it's not that extensive and not that important. So if we had this very uh, significant fire history for at least 5,000 years and lightning was in a very important then you know, where did all this fire come from? And most of us, and uh, we have to thank the anthropologists for this as well, most of us believe that Native Americans were responsible uh, for this extensive burning going on. And there's a lot of evidence, uh, direct and indirect oral history, early pioneers and so forth, uh, talking about Native American burning and all of the reasons that they burn. So we think that Native Americans um, were responsible and it doesn't take a lot of people really to burn extensive areas, particularly when you get into the prairie area, the savanna area, and even our Eastern Oak Forest. Um, um, fires can be fairly extensive uh, set by relatively few people. So the question is why were they burning? Well, there's dozens and dozens of reasons for that. Um, and, you know, this has been worked out over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, hunting, driving game, um, crop management, uh, rejuvenating fields, forest management. I'll talk about Native American silviculture, creating and preserving agricultural fields, getting rid of unwanted tree species, promoting desired species. And yes, Native Americans had, the, had figured all this stuff out apparently. Fireproofing areas, pest management, warfare signaling, clearing areas for travel to create open forests so they, didn't, um, they aren't too brushy, felling trees, clearing land, and just a culture of burning. And most of us now believe um, they were very good fire managers, but although this, I should say that this is now under attack, the people that are so focused on climate uh, do not want to admit that Native Americans would, were good fire managers because they want to believe that everything was controlled by climate change. And this is very sad and makes me angry, and I've been writing articles about this lately, trying to preserve uh, this notion that started developing in the 1970s and I thought really became um, ecological theory, but is now under attack by the climate people saying, no, 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 we have to attribute everything to climate. So this is uh, very disturbing to me and we have to watch out about that. But one of the ideas that I've really been enamored with um, that I started thinking about was how important fire was to the diet of the native, native people. You burn prairie, you get luxuriant forage for the animals that live there. You get much better grain production. When you burn under oak and hickory and chestnut, you get great, you improve the mass production, the acorn production. Most people that manage blueberries know that every couple of years, you should burn those blueberries and get terrific fruit production. So I'm, a, I'm very much a believer, and I wrote a review paper uh, on this a number of years ago that I think uh, there are many reasons why Native Americans use fire, but one of the very important ones was uh, to enhance their diet for uh, mast um, and fruit and shrubs and grasses, not only to feed themselves, but also to feed the animals that they were hunting. So it's a win-win situation. And I was really um, quite interested in, in that idea. And I think it, it's really quite intriguing. So if you think about the Eastern forest, it's not only in a mesic part of the country, 
but the species, particularly our broadleaf species, are relatively mesic. And they are not that pyrogenic. They're not that easy to burn. So, uh, and they really won't burn on, on their own, particularly because lightning fires are not that important. It really takes a human effort and timing, particularly a dry spring and a peak burning season historically will be coming up in April. By the way, after snow melts, we get an April uh, drought, the oak and pine foliage dries out. And in that, during that time period, a fire will carry very well. It won't happen on its own. So we think this human effort for promoting a fire is really uh, very important. And just uh, to show uh, the data has been worked out, what were the Native American populations um, at, the, at the time of uh, European settlement, 1492. And we believe that Native American populations were high enough and dense enough to sustain fire uh, throughout most of the East, particularly with the idea that it does not take a lot of people to do a lot of burning. Okay, so just to show what the major tribes uh, were in Pennsylvania, the Muncie, Delaware, uh, Iroquois, Erie, Shawnee, Ohio Valley tribe, um, Susquehannock, uh, Lenape, uh, Delaware, uh, and shown their distribution. Once again, they were throughout Pennsylvania, um, throughout the state. And if we look at the settlement patterns of Pennsylvania, it basically started in the Southeast as probably many of you know, around Philadelphia and basically worked its way westward or from southeast to north up west. I will point out um, some of the most fertile parts of Pennsylvania were really in this, in the southeast and then also the Pittsburgh area. But of course, all of the state was heavily forested. So even if it wasn't prime for agriculture, it was prime for forestry. And there was a lot of pressure on our land, um, starting with the uh, 1600s. Okay, after I moved to Pennsylvania, I was intrigued uh, with the idea that in Northern Pennsylvania, um, and this uh, happens to be uh, Hearts Content, a beautiful old growth, Northern uh, hardwood conifer type of forest, uh, in the part of the state that should be dominated by that type. But um, some of my own work in reading the literature, I found that there were actually fingers of oak that existed throughout Northern Pennsylvania that it extended into Western New York. And I was kind of intrigued by this. Why would the oak forest that's important in the Southeast part of Pennsylvania extend into the northern part and the western part. So one thing that we hypothesized, so instead of having the northern hardwood conifer, you'll have a mixed oak forest like this. I thought maybe that these oak forests were associated with Native American settlements. So then the question becomes, can Native Americans actually change northern hardwood conifer forests to oak and hickory and chestnut dominated forest. And that's uh, basically what we found out. When we went to these areas, we also looked at where the Native American trails and villages and fields were. And then we computed a Native American index and found where the Native Americans lived in the Northern hardwood and conifer forest. We had greatly increased red oak, white oak, chestnut, hickory, black oak, and walnut another important mass species. Um, and basically it seems like the Native American species were able to change these Northern forests more to oak and mass dominated forests. And without their influence, they would have been dominated by uh, beech and maple and birch and hemlock um, and so forth. So we uh, did some uh, work on that. Another question that I was interested in is that okay, if Native Americans were able to actually change the forest from Northern hardwood um, to um, oak and hickory, what about those really bad glacial outwash soils up there? 
why were there Native American fields up there as well? And I remember reading a paper uh, from the Amazon about Black Earth taking these very old, highly weathered um, tropical soils and making where that really could not support agriculture very well, but then managing these forests by adding animal waste, crop residue, charcoal, and, and so forth to make them much more fertile. And this is called the Black Earth, if you want to Google that. Um, it's a very uh, interesting thing. So, um, so I decided to do some work on this. And, and luckily in some areas in the Northeast, this happens to be Fort Drum in New York, they've preserved some of these Native American village sites and Native American field sites. And this happens to be one of these sites, interestingly, that's still dominated by Kenopodium or Lamb's Quarter, which was um, very tiny seeds, but if you collect enough of these seeds, you can get a nice flower and grain out of that, which is very important to the Native Americans. Um, so we compared that to the gl uh, typical glacial outwash uh, that existed in that area, did a side-by-side -side comparison, and actually dominate, uh, documented a Black Earth concept in these Native American fields which much higher phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium compared to the control glacial outwash soils. Now there's a lot of glacial outwash uh, up north that's not good for agriculture, but we believe that the Native Americans actually managed these like the native tribes did in uh, Amazonia to create a black earth to make these very poor soils. Um, much better for agriculture. Uh, so I'd like to talk about some of the fire history work and I can't believe how quickly time is, is going here. Um, and I hope I'm, I'm not going too fast, but I'd like to uh, uh, push on here. Um, we studied this old growth forest at, in Savage Mountain that exists in Maryland, but also extends to Pennsylvania. This is some of my co-authors, Charles Ruffner, uh, Duralyn Shumway with a beautiful um, red oak. Uh, and some of these trees are over 400 years old uh, in the stand and really quite remarkable. This is a nice white oak with a nice big cat face from being burned uh, many multiple times over the year. And now one thing that we did was look at the witness tree records and uh, back in the 1700s, Savage Mountain was dominated by white oak, hickory, black oak, Chest, uh, chestnut oak, chestnut and red oak. With, but what we don't see is the red maple and black birch. And then in our forest survey done in uh, 2000, we can see this huge increase in red maple and this huge increase in black birch. And um, so there's this major uh, change uh, uh, going on along with the loss of hickory, chestnut from the blight, a very uh, big decline in white oak, and I'll talk uh, more about that later. Now, one of the strangest things that happened at Savage Mountain um, is that uh, some people in the state, and there's a big controversy about this, whether it was intentional or by mistake, they actually started doing some selective logging, which you would never get permission to do in the East, normally with a 400 year old old growth forest. But we heard about this um, and as tragic as it was being opportunistic and realizing that there was an opportunity here, we went and was able to recut these stumps. And I think probably most of you know that you can sand these stumps very nicely, look at the uh, individual growth rings and then find the actual fire scars that got embedded because most fires don't kill the tree they will scar it and then over time the tree will just regrow over that scar and then we can do a very nice job of dating these fires and in the east these typically stopped around 1940 about the stop the start of Smokey the Bear. So this was a nice opportunity at Savage Mountain to put together a 400 year 
of fire history with, that had a return cycle of about eight years, which is very typical for the mid-Atlantic region. But then um, after 1900, a decline in fires. And then when Smokey the Bear really started kicking in and the fire suppression era started, uh, basically these fires really dwindled down to nothing. And without this fire, that allowed the increase in species like red maple and black birch. And then the decline in the oak hickory and chestnut, which can no longer regenerate very well underneath their own canopy without the fire. So we can uh, see that for 400 years, we had nice continuous oak recruitment. We got to the early 1900s, and then this whole big uh, mess here of trees is really the red maple and black birch coming in that we see throughout the eastern forest as a result of fire suppression. So this was a nice direct linking of um, oak recruitment with fire and then the cessation of oak recruitment when fire stopped and the big increase in red maple and black birch, which is happening throughout the uh, eastern uh, US. But you know, once again, a picture says uh, a thousand words. This is a beautiful uh, white oak. This happens to be in West Virginia. I want to use that as a second example, but not regenerating, but just surrounded uh, by um, uh, by red maple, beech, um, sugar maple, just surrounding this beautiful old growth white oak. So it's not regenerating regenerating in the shade, but basically far succession is taking over. And then over time, we will, we believe will replace these oak species. Uh, within this forest, there was a nice cohort of white pine, old white pine that probably started in a large gap uh, as shown here. And then if we look at the tree ring data, again, continuous recruitment, of white oak, more episod episodic um, recruitment of white pine. So there was a, probably a nice disturbance here around 1830, 1840, another nice disturbance here around 1875 uh, for white oak. But then again, after 1900 and then um, a fire stopped, the big increase in the red maple, sugar maple and beech. And we can see this really throughout the eastern forest that over the last hundred years, the oaks are not regenerating very well and the more shade tolerant uh, species are. So is there evidence, recent evidence of fire and oak? And one of the really good places to look at that is basically on military bases. Not only are they using live ordinances, so they're dropping bombs and creating fires, but interestingly, the military um, are, are very good uh, ecological managers and they use prescribed burning. So if they're not getting enough fire in their oak and pine from their military exercises, they are supplementing this with prescribed burning. Um, so here's, um, I, I got a project at Fort Indian Town Gap not too far from you guys in uh, Southeast Pennsylvania that shows the burning that has gone on um, at, you know, from uh, 1975 to about 2000. And those areas that did get burning uh, were still dominated totally by oak in these diameter classes without having the red maple component. And then what these forests looked like were this, this is an oak forest on a military base that was burned frequently, still dominated by oak in the canopy, but even more important, oak seedlings, oak saplings, oak pole-sized trees that you basically do not find in unburned forests. And there was a lot of evidence for charcoal uh, in these um, forests as well as the evidence of burning uh, that used to uh, be going on. Um, so after the clear-cut era from about 1870 to about 1930, uh, maybe you are aware that there were uh, all over the country these million acre burns that were going, going on in all of this logging slash. Uh, 
And nobody was really very happy about that, you know, loss of life, loss of property and buildings. So in the 1930s, uh, it became a, a government mandate to suppress fire. And um, the mascot for that was Smokey the Bear. We all know that, we all grew up with all of that stuff. Um, and basically took fire from too high, too catastrophic down to almost nothing. So all of these fire types in the Eastern US and also in the Western US, but I'm not talking about today, the prairie, uh, the savannas, the Eastern oak pine, pyrogenic were no longer getting the fire that they needed. So at the time of European settlement, we very much had a pyrogenic system. Prairies and savannas, very pyrogenic. Eastern uh, oak and pine, pyrogenic. And even in the north, mostly northern hardwood, but still pyrogenic areas there. But now fire was shut down uh, in the east from Smokey the Bear. And then all of this is now changing in a process uh, Dr. Nowacki and I call mesification, the loss of pyrogenic vegetation to more mesic vegetation uh, dominated by, um, by birch and beech and, and maple and hemlock and, and species like that, which can be illustrated in a picture like this. We still have some of the nice old oak still in the overstory, but look at what is happening to this forest without fire. The oaks are not regenerating and just a sea or an ocean of red maple and a few other species are just taking over and light levels, the forest is too dense, light levels are too low for the oaks to regenerate. Um, so, uh, before European settlement, certainly before Smokey the Bear, we had uh, frequently burned areas with open oak and pine forest. And then after Smokey the Bear, we lost our fire. This became closed canopy forest where the oak and pine could no longer regenerate. More shade tolerant species were the one that did regenerate in that shade like red maple, sugar maple, beech, hemlock. And we believe the next generation, we will be losing this oak hickory pine component and getting much larger increases in these mesophytic species. And so not only is the composition changing, but the microenvironment of these uh, forests are changing. So now it's harder to introduce fire. It's easy to get to run a fire through this system, it's very hard to get it in this mesification with the high humidity, high moisture, low flammability of that fuel. I do want to just say a few words about deer uh, because that is another big problem. So fire suppression is a problem. High deer populations, more than 20 deer per square mile is a big problem throughout uh, much of the eastern US. This is uh, some work I did in Valley Forge, not far from you guys, that have some of the highest deer populations in the eastern US in places over 100 per square mile that basically eat all of the woody vegetation and only leave this Asian stilt grass because it is toxic uh, to the deer. Uh, and all of the edible woody plants have basically been eaten. So I've gotten some projects in my career uh, to put up deer fences about a couple meters high. And you can see outside of the fence, the deer will basically eat everything in that understory unless it's toxic, but we put a fence up and within a couple of years, we get a nice, we get some nice regeneration going on in this forest. So the deer is certainly uh, having a very big impact. And if we couple that um, with silviculture by taking out the undesirable species like the red maple, we reintroduce understory burning. Uh, we put up the deer fence as shown here and we wait for a mast year with very high acorn production. This is the formula for getting our oak forest back. It's not 
uh, you know, rocket science, as they say, it's not that difficult, but you need to do a couple things and we can save our oak forest, getting deer populations down, thinning out the undesirable species, reintroducing fire. And then when we get mass years, we get really nice cohorts of oak regeneration. So this is a very possible thing to do. Um, one of the thing that I wanted to mention, you would think with all the deer in the Eastern US, we would have very sparse forests. But in a recent paper, we documented just the opposite, that in the East, there is a densification problem of forests, even in the face of deer pressure. Again, it's a paradox. All these deer, all this browsing, but we're still having a densification problem. And the point is, is that the suppression of fire is trumping the deer browsing and allowing a lot of undesirable species to make our forests overly dense uh, and still not getting our oak and hickory regeneration. So yes, you can get densification uh, in the east, which is another big problem that should be on your radar screen, even in the face of deer browsing. Deer really does not create savannas. They create overly dense forests of undesirable species. So I am getting close to finishing up here. Uh, so again, we can save our Eastern uh, forests uh, by doing a selective logging of unwanted. I hadn't, didn't have time to get into the whole invasive thing. I think you all know that living in Philadelphia, you have more than your share in invasives. Uh, preparing proper seed beds, open understories, keeping uh, deer populations low. Um, now I just, uh, I do wanna finish up by getting back to this climate thing. And then uh, we all know about um, global warming going on, but isn't it interesting that a lot of the Eastern US has not had significant warming. It's just one of these really weird things. Yes, it's out West. Yes, it's farther North. Now the Northern tier has warmed significantly, but places where I do a lot of my work a climate has not been the major driver of forest change because really it hasn't warmed that much. And there's actually places in the South where it has not warmed at all over let's say the last 120 years. So the point that I wanna make in my research that most of the changes in the forest in the East is not due to climate change I'm not saying it won't happen in the future, but really due to fire suppression, increasing shade tolerance species. Um, grassland and savannas being invaded because of fire suppression. Um, uh, aspen increasing because of extensive cutting places in the lake states. Losing our chestnut because of the blight. Losing a lot of our beach because of the beach bark disease. So climate change has not been the primary driver, although um, I will say that um, if it continues, it may become a more important driver, but let's not go climate crazy, at least right now at, at this point in time and recognize we're still in a regime where past land use and even really present land use and problems are still dominating uh, the changes uh, in our forest. So I, I will finish up. I'm coming on eight o'clock here, so I didn't do too badly. Uh, the Eastern forest had a long history of indigenous burning. Native American depopulation, Smokey the Bear, big loss of fire. Uh, this was a big uh, turning event, a big ecological event on the negative side for Eastern forests. We are now losing our fire dependent vegetation that used to dominate probably 80% of the Eastern US. Uh, forests are becoming overly dense with undesirable species. Uh, they are going through mesification. So we're not getting our oaks regenerating and it's getting harder to uh, introduce fire. We're losing very um, important species ecologically, but also economically. Uh, there's problems with biodiversity, invasives, habitat. 
Um, and this mesification is actually making our forests more vulnerable in, in case we do get future drought. I know at this point in time, actually precipitation has increased in the east over the last hundred years, but that may change. We may get a lot more warming. So if all of a sudden drought and significant warming kicks in, we're gonna have forests that are very vulnerable because of the way they've changed. And Eastern forests, uh, we just can't let, let them lie um, and basically uh, accept uh, these, these kind of uh, unique and novel ecosystems that if we want to save Eastern oak and pine and hickory and maybe bring chestnut back, we need uh, intensive management and restoration ecology. So I'll end there and be happy to take any questions, but thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that so much. So people, um, it's eight o'clock now, but we'll go, we can go another 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 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 Mark will happily answer some questions. Um, if you do need to sign off, thank you so much for being here. Next week at seven o'clock, we'll be talking about the American toad, which has a great Roxborough connection, and then in two weeks, uh, insect biodiversity. Oh, Mark, so as people are asking questions, and there's a few in chat already, and actually we had a great chat going on while Mark was talking, so thank you all. Um, People's impression of Pennsylvania forest, let's go back to 1600 before European colonization uh, wasn't really intensive. So the, the assumption is that, well, I've heard this metaphor that a squirrel could essentially climb trees across the entire state of Pennsylvania from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh since neither existed yet. And the only issue would be crossing the Susquehanna River, but essentially a squirrel could go to from tree to tree. But what I'm hearing with you now is that there is much more breaks in right. Pennsylvania forests that were essentially created by the Lenape. Yeah, well, to some extent, the forests were quite continuous, but you have to remember that um, there was an extensive settlement pattern by Native American villages, agricultural fields. Uh, so there were those type of, 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 of breaks, but uh, Pennsylvania was always a heavily forested area, but also because of agriculture, towns, trails, and so forth. Um, uh, I can't guarantee that, that a squirrel could make it all the way across the state. Right. Pre-colonial -pre settlement, um, probably, but they would have been going, or going around some of the fire breaks, which is... Um, and for everybody here, I, I recommend Charles Mann's work, uh, 1491, on yeah. what North America looked like before, the Americas looked like before, before Columbus. Sandy asked, did the oaks coexist with prairies or were the prairies created upon the oaks' demise? Uh, well, they, they did. And, and a very important type in the Midwest was the oak savanna, which is basically sparse oak trees with a prairie understory. And depending on the amount of fire, that those systems kind of change from prairie to savanna, um, and then to close oak forests as you got farther east. So yes, they did coexist together. Did the Roosevelt era CCC influence the rise of Smokey the Bear? Uh, yeah, I, I would. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would have to say that's true because one of their mandates was putting out all of those catastrophic fires. But you have to remember why we had the catastrophic fires. That was because of the clear cut era from about 1870 to 1930, where basically just about all of the Eastern US was cut and they left the logging slash there. And when that dried out, that's when we got those million acre fires that were just happening one right. after another throughout the U.S. In that era, I think that Williamsport in Pennsylvania had more millionaires per capita than any other town because there were all, all the loggers were there. <laughs> yeah, right, for a very short time, yes. Um, Alice wonders, why are some trees more valuable than others? Why oaks versus maples? Well, um, well, I would say ecologically, oak probably wins out because of the mass production uh, which is so it's such an important food source for dozens and dozens of different animals and and insects and wildlife and so forth. Um, now, maple gets a little bit complicated because sugar maple is a hard maple and that has a nice economic value. But red maple being a soft maple has lower economic value. So I put that below the oak. Uh, 
but that has a lot to do with how tastes change. Uh, people uh, go from uh, maple to oak to birch and so forth. And so those prices do change, but at least ecologically, I would argue that, uh, that oaks are, are more important certainly than red maple. Right. And if I added my two cents, um, there's a wonderful writer, Doug Tallamy, who writes about native plants. Nature's Best Hope is his new book. And he talks about oak trees in as a keystone tree right. Right. for caterpillars. Ah, interesting. Um, there's more than 500 species of caterpillars in Pennsylvania that live on oaks. Yeah. Uh, no other tree comes close. I didn't know so, that many. Yeah. And so for all the birds, even seed eating birds, uh, when they are raising young, they're stuffing caterpillars down the young's throat because caterpillars are sort of a protein sack with no, no big exoskeleton. Yeah. So all those birds. Need, so you want birds, you got to have caterpillars. Want caterpillars, you got to have oaks. Yeah. So that's another. Yeah, I think uh, oaks can be argued as a keystone species. Uh, and that's just another example of that. Uh, Beverly wants to know what role will the spotted, the red spotted lanternfly play in our forests? Huh. A new invasive species. So yeah, I, um, I, I don't have a great answer, but I will say that, um, I mean, every two to five years, we have another problem like that. That's the flavor of the month right now. Um, so these problems um, always, exists um, and they're not going to go away. I wouldn't say that by itself would represent the demise of oak. Um, remember the emerald ash borer that we don't hear as much about now because we hear so much about the, the spotted lantern fly. So there's always going to be those those type of problems. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I wouldn't put it in the top five, but uh, I, I don't want to be dismissive of it. Okay. Either. Dave wonders if we know what forests looked like before Native Americans were here, what trees would have dominated then? Well, that's where I think the witness tree records do come in that were um, able um, to reconstruct what at least what the composition and to some extent what the density of those forests were like at the time of European settlement. Um, but I should say there's another field of study called paleoecology, where people go out and take pollen and charcoal samples in lake sediment and bog sediments, and can also analyze the pollen that is there uh, to let us know what species were important, let's say a thousand years ago. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um... What can we do to reverse or improve the situation, Jim Wonders? Okay, well, I did try to talk about that a little bit with some of the case studies that, that I've worked on. Um, I think we have a fairly good idea of, of how to do it. It's, it's finding the people that are willing to make that effort to in some way keep deer populations low uh, to uh, thin out the undesirable species, to open up our forests, potentially reintroduce uh, understory burning. And if we can do those things, as I showed in my talk, uh, we, we can get the oak to regenerate. So the Eastern forest can be saved. Are, um, Cecilia, aren't all growth forests so crucial as to be left untouched? Uh, I would say that, that that's a very interesting question and I have worked on, on that. Interestingly, if, if you're talking about old growth oak and pine and you're thinking about preserving that for thousands of years, that actually takes management. Because if you do not uh, uh, do understory burning, even if it is old growth in oak and pine, uh, in almost all places, you will lose that to ma the maple beech type. So I know it's a strange concept, but even uh, now, if it's if you're in northern hardwoods and you have uh, you know old growth uh, sugar maple, beech, and hemlock, you don't want to do anything with it, but just let it get old and be old. You probably don't have to do anything with it. But if you're in the mid-Atlantic region like Savage Mountain and you want to maintain it, 
as uh, oak hickory and pine, uh, then that takes some management. This is a related question. What's the benefit of managing a forest versus letting it be? It seems oak trees require a lot of management from humans. I think that's the big surprise for a lot of people is that if you want oaks, you have to manage the forest. Yeah, yeah. They generally do not persist on their own, except on some very dry sites. Is a request that you give this to the DC NARS Bureau of, uh, and the Bureau of Forestry at the state. You should give this lecture to them. <laughs> yeah, I think they know my work. And luckily there's a guy named Pat Bros that works on the Allegheny National Forest. And he and I are, are very similar in our thinking. And I've read uh, they are now um, getting a, a fire program going up in the Allegheny National Forest. So. Um, when I first got to Penn State almost 34 years ago, this idea about fire and oak was very foreign to the uh, state foresters, but now they are quite familiar with it. And I've actually educated a lot of them at Penn State. So they know the fire and oak story now. Okay. So we'll, we'll do one more question and actually uh, we'll combine two. Um, there's some questions about fire uh, in the sense of how do you do fire like in Southeastern Pennsylvania when it's so densely populated? Yeah. Although not, Natural Lands Trust does that perhaps more, more so in meadows than they do in, uh, in forests. Um, but also uh, given the degree of habitat fragmentation in forests, um, does fire, would fire uh, have a negative impact on insects and animals? Um, not that I'm aware of, and I understand that um, there's a lot of limitations to broadcast burning, and you may have to just be burning relatively small areas. But if you're in a pyrogenic type and you are putting fire back into that system, I'm not aware of any big negative biodiversity things uh, from doing that. I think the um, the opposite is more of the problem. Thank you. Well, Mark, thank you for your time. Everybody who's here, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, hope we see you next week. Thank you to Amanda uh, for being our Zoom co-pilot. We really appreciate it, Amanda. Thank you so much. Uh, and Mark, that was really a wonderful talk. Really appreciate yeah, your time. Thank you. Glad. And thanks, everybody. I, I was very impressed. I think there was 93 yeah. at one point, and I, that really impressed me. And Thank you, and it was my pleasure, and, and hope to meet you personally one day. Well, that'd be great. Thank you, Mark. Let's take care. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody.